through community care, invited Dr. Eric to share his findings in this complex and sometimes confusing world of care as people are living longer with these advanced diseases. So I ask that you please join me in listening and learning and to welcome Dr. Mm -hmm. Eric to us tonight. Thank you. So I downloaded something off the internet that's going to take care of my speech tonight. So I just need to pull that up for a second. Just kidding. So thank you so much for that uh, gracious introduction. Now thank you for the invitation. It is an honor to be here with people who many years ago thought that this space that we work in and all of us will come to needs to be treated differently. And so I honor the journey that you've been on. And uh, as far as thought leader, I am merely carrying on the tradition of trying to care for human beings. So it's, uh, it's a collective, so I thank all of you. When I speak around the country and around the world, it's always an honor to come and learn and grow and listen and collaborate in a collective manner so we can change the world. I don't say that lightly. I think the opportunity for us is to recognize what is a uniquely human experience, to embrace it, understand it, not shy away from tough conversations, that space, and have a collective dialect that resonates from border to border, and really moves the pendulum in the right direction for care. And as I'll talk about a little bit later, uh, there are some economic factors. But it's all predicated on meeting each individual one day at a time, one hour at a time, one minute at a time. I come to this space as a physician, as a parent, as an educator, as a former board member, and most recently as a true human being, having walked this journey with my own mother who boss, <coughs> excuse me, uh, passed away about five weeks ago. So this is the first engagement I've had with that perspective. And, and I bring that forward as a very valuable, humbling experience. So I'd like to frame our time together as an opportunity again to engage, to set aside the conflicting paradigms and platforms that invade our lives daily. So as physicians, there's the human being, a biologic entity that with absolute certainty has a beginning and an end. I choose to look at the end as not the opposite of the life, but a culmination of. So the conversation is how we live and love, learn and grow through every breath. Our medical education system is a conflicting paradigm to this entity. We are taught to do things to pathology. I offer it is resonant with failure, because at some point for all of us, pathology or candles on a birthday cake, the system wears out. I was trained to do things to that system, and the more it wears out, the more we do to it. But what we know is the more we do to it, the faster this negative trajectory most often we fail to accomplish what we want to, which is increase life quality and life length. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy of failure. Other conflicting paradigms are the system of medicine. We need to do things to people rather than for them and with them. And I would challenge us and say from a societal perspective, 
this being a very atypical crowd. But particularly in the United States, I've done a lot of work in Tanzania. I have a lot of colleagues and have spoken all over the world. We fear the unknown, which is a human quality. But in this country, if you are aged or sick, if you're not on the cover of GQ or Vogue, both of which I will never be on the cover of, then you have done something wrong. And so we cease to recognize this human experience. And it's bastardized by all these other entities. Death is an option in the healthcare system. There are more things we can do to you, but we fail to tell the truth. And we fail more often to offer complete transparency with what's going on at any given time. How did we get here? I think it's interesting to take a step back and understand the history of what brought us to tonight. We know that the insurance paradigm manifested shortly after World War I. After World War II, from a societal perspective, uh, there was the rise of the middle class, if you will. It was a golden age in industrialization. And technology began its march forward, as was mentioned earlier, to the point that if we look back 60, 70 years when modern hospital systems were established, we weren't able to diagnose a lot of the things we do now. We weren't able to care for a lot of the things we are now. It was an acute care setting. You had a baby, you broke your leg, you went home. So the system is not set up to care for where we are today from a technologic standpoint or from a physiologic standpoint. It's just not prepared. Most recently, since I've been in this field the past 15 years, uh, the technology and the pharmacology has exponentially outpaced potentially thinking ethically about what we offer. I am certainly not ascribing to withholding care, limiting care. I'm just saying just because we can doesn't mean we should. And we have put the cart so far in front of the horse, we find ourselves trying to backtrack and make sense out of the human experience and come to somebody's bedside and say, actually, this is not going to change the outcome. Must be my new cologne. That's it. <laughs> it's a Windex pledge combination. <laughs> and so it's put us in a pickle as healthcare providers and as a society. We focus on curative measures. Everything we do as physicians is not curative. Every patient that I have ever seen and will ever see is going to die. I'm going to die. I don't want that to happen too soon, but it is an absolute. And we need to discuss it, we need to honor it, and we need to change the way we think about it from a societal perspective and from a healthcare perspective. An interesting thing that parallels the growth and development of insurance and systems in the business model of medicine is the concept of risk. And as a healthcare system, we have become risk avoidant. At the top of most health systems are legal and financial. Five years on the board of Unity Point Health System, which is not unique, okay? But the second largest non-denominational system in the country, I never heard the word patient. And we are an accountable care organization trying to transition from volume to value. I would say that that right there is antithetical to actually caring for a human being. And so the concept of risk pervades our conversations. I was in Washington, D.C. last week, meeting with the head of Dartmouth, Brookings, Duke, research, health policy. How do we need to shift and change to have a conversation that has meaning in this space to provide better quality care, which we know eventually will lead to the economic outcomes that systems want.
a little bit about the program I developed over the last 10 years uh, and where I'm at today. And then I want to talk about really why we're all here. So I came from a rural affiliate in the Unity Point Health System, had the great honor and privilege participating in a Medicare, Medicaid, Centers for Innovation pilot program. Essentially had a whiteboard, they said, figure it out. Within the first three months of our program, we had a verbose inpatient consultation rate nearing 40%. We had a full-time ambulatory clinic with three practitioners. We were embedded in every long-term care facility within eight counties of northwestern Iowa. We were embedded in every tertiary care center and outpatient clinic within those same counties, made home visits. Wherever a human being could be touched or there was need, we did that 24 hours a day. Every patient I've ever had has had my cell phone number. We were embedded in the emergency department. We were part of the oncology team. So you came in for your first medical oncology visit. Here's social work, here's palliative care. It was seamless. We were embedded in the intensive care unit. And so when I say I've sat on the board, but I've also changed urine-soaked sheets at 2 in the morning, I have. And that's the understanding about how to transform the space and the tremendous opportunity that True and Pace as a marriage have to define what is possible for this community and beyond. Again, coming from D.C. last week, we are yearning for success stories. And if that's my parole officer, I'm not here. Okay. <laughs> and so it is a tremendous opportunity, and I honor the space that you come to to support this, and I hope it does not end tonight, because it's not about writing checks. It's not just about providing fantastic centerpieces. It is a way of thinking and a way of engaging, a way of listening and hearing, sharing and empowering others to challenge their own beliefs. So palliative medicine, what is this entity? Over the last 10 years, there have been a lot of shingles held out across the country, a lot of health systems and clinics. It has been a hip thing to do. I would offer, we are in our pre-adolescence as a subspecialty. Just a decade into accreditation, we're still trying to figure out who we are and what we can and should be. Most often, it is circumscribed to come have the conversation, get them out of the hospital so they don't die in the hospital. Get them to hospice. We don't want a regulatory ding which is tethered to some financial penalties, come have the talk. There is value in the talk. Palliative care and hospice are inexorably tied. Different sides of the same coin. When we move upstream, however, I sat at 96 plus months life expectancy. So not just six weeks or six months, but four, five, six years. That's where the true value of a palliative perspective, engagement with 50% of the body that is physiologic and 50% of the body that is emotive, spiritual, religious, if one ascribes to it. For no human being can move forward unless both halves are acknowledged and we are one being whether it's the last days of our life or 25 years from it. As healthcare providers, if we fail to recognize that, then we're stealing from you. We're stealing from you the opportunity to choose to write your own chapters. Thank you for sharing earlier. It's a journey, again, that I've just experienced with my mother who died from dementia and lung disease and so years ago, we knew where this was going. And conversations took place. And so the last 
12 months, I stepped away from my practice at Unity Point. And I've walked this journey with my mother and my father and the rest of our family. The last three weeks, we all camped out at mom and dad's house, drank a lot of wine, had a lot of laughs, celebrated the human experience while grieving, but we lived and loved and laughed and learned and honored her one moment at a time. She said, I don't want a funeral. Fierce. Fiercely independent Irish woman. I want an Irish celebration with a lot of scotch. <laughs> and so we honored her with a memorial service and celebrated that journey. So we can grieve, but we can live through that time as well. And palliative medicine is the confluence of that journey years before that moment in time in expertise in symptom management, transparency, coordination with other physicians, other health entities, and meeting the patient and their caregivers where they're at one day at a time. The first oath I took in medical education was the Hippocratic Oath, and the first line says, do no harm. If I don't tell you, and I'm going to pick on you, okay? If I don't tell you the truth, X, Y, and Z disease, because I don't think you're ready for it, or I have this litany of things that can be done to you, I'm stealing from you. This is not my journey. This is your journey, and it's your life. I need to be a servant to you and those that support you. Period. I need to go from here to here. A little bit of medicine, but a whole lot of care. So I'm going to ask, how many have ever been to Amsterdam? Okay, and I don't need to know why, because <laughs> it's almost a moot point now in Colorado, but all right. So that's our stopping off point to Tanzania. And this is going to frame, hopefully, what has come before us and what predominates care presently. And then we're going to shift to talk about what is possible. In Amsterdam, who's been to the Rembrandt Museum? These are the cool kids. <laughs> Rembrandt, Dutch master, Renaissance. Chiatoscuro, light out of darkness. If you look at a self-portrait of Rembrandt, wow, it's powerful. There is value. The color palette, the brush strokes are amazing. But when I've stood in front of that self-portrait of Rembrandt, whether it is May or October, morning, night, rainy, sunny, hungover or not, usually hungover. It is just that, it is static. It's Rembrandt. That to me represents our healthcare system. It's a linear algorithmic model. It does not change. If A, then B, then C, then D, then E. Regardless of where we are on our journeys. We know with emphatic proof that does not work. It's probably why I woke up one day and said, this is what I have to do. Personal experience, looking around, tasting that flavor and saying it can be better. Come back across the Atlantic. Who's been to the Museum of Modern Art, New York City? Okay. May, October morning, night, sunny, rainy, when I stand in front of a Jackson Pollock, who's a familiar with Jackson Pollock, right? Or three or four times in the same visit, it takes on a different meaning to me. This is the algorithm of life. The painting changes depending on who I am, what I've experienced, where I'm at on my journey. Why do we find it so difficult to transition to a Jackson Pollock mentality in our own lives, let alone healthcare? I see parents say, Johnny, let's just keep walking. This doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense, but life doesn't make sense. Life is full of ambiguity and risk and the unknown. Every patient I've ever had 
I ask, are you afraid? They inevitably say, I'm not scared of dying. Not the question I asked. They say, Doc, I'm afraid of getting dead. What's that really mean? That's the ambiguity. That's the unknown. From this point in time, whether it's six hours or six years, to that line in the sand that is a physician, a preacher, my grandfather was a preacher, and anyone in between, I can't change that line in the sand. I honor it. I respect it. But this is what we need to change. We need to transition from a Rembrandtian perspective to a Jackson Pollock perspective. So how do we do that? Again, you have my cell phone number. You call me 24 hours a day. Really, we start to create a true sense of community. Redefine, redevelop what's been lost over the last century. It's about you and I. It's not about chemotherapy. It's not about robotic surgery. It's about saying, I acknowledge and honor the human space that you're in. Here's the truth that I know. Let me ask you what your little voice tells you in your heart. That's the greatest diagnostic tool I've ever known. It's not a fourth CAT scan. It's not blood work. And then we map it out one day at a time. So I see you. We meet. We define where we're at, where we've come from. The hard stop is saying, what is sacred to you? And that's how we map out the months, the years, the hours ahead. How do we overcome that sense of ambiguity and fear of the unknown? Call me. So Martha was in her early 70s diagnosed with widely metastatic lung cancer, terminal illness. We had the talk at diagnosis, a little bit of symptom management. About two weeks after I met her, I get a call about 2.30 in the morning. Dr. Tim, this is Martha. Martha, are you okay? Kind of silent. Are you, are you in pain? Are you having trouble breathing? No. Is Fred there, her husband? She must have held the phone out. I heard Fred snoring. I said, what's going on? She said, it is that time where I feel most alone and most vulnerable, the most uncertain, the most ambiguous time. Everyone's asleep. I don't want to wake them, not because they're not there for me, but it's a space that they're struggling with as well. I just feel alone. Can you be on the phone with me? Absolutely. A few minutes later, she says, Doc, she kind of chuckles. She said, I have a favor to ask. I go, what is it? She said, will you read me a story? I said, there's Dr. Seuss or Curious George. <laughs> That's, what you got. That's all I got. The point is, it's not a bell. It's not a whistle. It's a humanness. I didn't do anything miraculous for Martha that night. I acknowledged that space she was afraid of the closet monster. We turned on the light one day at a time. Our own vulnerabilities often preclude us from stepping into that space. Again, this is an atypical crowd, but most people fail to realize the power of walking that journey with another. How much we can live and learn and grow and be present in this space. That's what we need to transition to, to recreate a sense of community where we care for each other. In Tanzania, I can't get a Tylenol. Work in the remotest parts of the country. You drive three hours to go 20 miles. You get out and hike for an hour to go a couple kilometers. You come to a patient's house who's dealing with Fill in the blank. They've had a stroke. It's HIV. It's cancer. What am I doing there? I'm learning how to live, how to acknowledge, how to listen and hear. The power of that space is transcendental. The care that is offered through that exceeds 
99% of the care I've seen anywhere in this country. People in Tanzania don't want to die any sooner than we do, but they recognize it is a fact of life. And not that it invades every dinner conversation. You're born and you grow up knowing that that's going to happen. And so there's less fear because your community is going to be around and you needn't worry about the closet monster. There will always be somebody there. As I was thinking about <clears throat> my journey here tonight, I penned the following. And if you'll please forgive me for reading it, um, it's relatively new. And I hope there's some value, but I don't want to not give it its, its do justice. Um, and, and what this is about is we're not talking about health care reform. We're talking about reforming the way we care. So over 20 years ago, while making my way through the Monet's, Picasso's, and Van Gogh's of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, I stumbled upon a piece that moved me deeply and continues to capture my interest and inspire me today. In the southeast wing, from a ceiling two stories aloft, spread out another 30 to 40 yards on the ground, and about 20 feet wide is a carpet. It's a rug. It's red, it's green, it's brown, and it's really, really big. Reading the information placard off to the side, it says wool rug 100 BC. Middle East, Persia perhaps. 1,123 stitches per square inch. Artist unknown. I was breathless. I stood there, stunned at first because of the, the sheer size of this carpet and this work. And then the 1,123 stitches per square inch, or 161,712 per square foot, or roughly 116 million stitches in all. An immense amount of work. Years, decades, a lifetime, generations. And as I stood there, I was struck by the words that echoed artist unknown. There before me was this amazing work. I was curious who this individual was. How did they live, love, laugh, cry, learn? How did they die? And could they have possibly imagined the tremendous impact their work would have on another human being nearly 2,000 years later? Transfixed by this work, I stared, deaf to the commotion of onlookers and museum goers and life outside of this particular exhibit. And suddenly the greens and the reds and the browns, they melded into subtle hues of magenta and crimson and earth tones. No longer merely a rug or a carpet. This, this was a tapestry of the artisan's life, this unknown artist. Each thread of the 1,123 stitches per square inch representing an experience, an emotion, connection to family, friends, the world, the universe, to themselves. For nearly half an hour, I just stared. The simple pattern, relatively nondescript at first, it, it began to dance, transformed into a delicate collage of asymmetrical symmetry, like underwater currents swirling Darwin's island in the Galapagos, powerful waves of cool and warm colors carried one away to a different time a different place. 
the top was different than the bottom, and the sides, and the middle. It was different from the end, from the beginning. Mirroring, perhaps, times in that individual's life when they face challenges or times of change. The pattern, indeed, changed. Change. Change is another reason why we are here this evening. This is perhaps one of those magical opportunities for a letting go of former lives, practices, beliefs, ignorances, and embrace a future that transcends medicine and transcends how we have engaged in our own journeys and the journeys of those around us for many years. The thread handed to all of us as caregivers, as human beings, can embody the spirit of true community. We who are gathered today have the opportunity to create a culture whose power lies in bringing together like-minded individuals to effect positive change in the world. For we all seek significance. Our charge is to nurture the spirit of humanism, to incorporate it into our lives and practice through strength, diversity, and caring. Strength, to have the courage to look beyond oneself. Diversity, to choose the path less traveled. And caring, to encompass the entire human being. Utilizing these tenets, each of us has the responsibility to model and advocate for compassionate, patient-centered care. We have the opportunity to reconstruct that which has been lost nearly a century ago, the proverbial village. Individuals caring for each other as a whole, bringing meaning to one another. We need to seize this opportunity. Yet we need to be mindful of this mission as its narrative is often quelled by contemporary practices and perceptions. We're all faced with tremendous challenges extending us beyond the point of caring. So we must be mindful. At the heart of mindfulness are very few obstacles that we can't overcome. All of us are witness to the magnificent colors of the tapestry of humanity and have the honor of weaving the future, not just here in Boulder, but beyond. While an inner howl may assail us, a longing to flee this challenge, to flee the ambiguity of life, the needle and the thread await. The world is waiting. Simply be present. Simply be a person. This is where we start. Presence comes from being present. So hold on to each other, for it is the collective that we transcend medicine and we begin to truly care for each other and for humanity. Hold this sacred lest it get lost, stolen, or deranged. Connectivity is the force that bridges the chasm of past, future, health, and well-being, ambiguity, and that which is known. We must have faith in ourselves and the world because faith replaces doubt. Improvise. As Philippe Petit, the famous wire walker, said, improvisation is empowering because it welcomes the unknown. And since what is impossible is always unknown, it allows us to believe we can cheat the impossible. Inspire yourselves. By inspiring ourselves, we inspire others. It is my personal hope that with this thread 
We will fulfill our destinies as heirs to a universal form of inspiration in creating a true community and guiding others to wellness. Know also that this thread is our heritage, representing strength, diversity, and caring, and that these are opiates of immeasurable potency. They are the tools by which our tapestry will be passed along for the next 2,000 years. Thank you all very much.